Episode 103, The Paradox. Welcome to The Paradox with your attending, Dr. Eric Larson. He is a practicing anesthesiologist and clinical assistant professor at Michigan State University College of Human Medicine. Listen in as he takes you behind the scenes of what practicing medicine in today's ever-changing world is like with another doctor. The Paradox is a fun and accidentally informative show for physicians, patients, or anyone who has ever found themselves in a waiting room. Welcome to The Paradox. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Larson. Thank you for joining me as we explore the U.S. medical system in a fun and informative format through expert analysis. Today's expert is Dr. Rebecca Bernard. She's the owner of Gulf Coast DPC, and she's a co-author of a book called Patients at Risk that she co-authored with Dr. Niran el I've actually had Dr. el and Dr. Bernard on the show previously, but today's show is going to focus on mid-level providers, advanced practice providers, or physician extenders, whatever term you like or dislike, I guess. We're going to focus primarily on nurse practitioners, but also physician assistants, pharmacists, psychologists, optometrists, nurse midwives, and nurse anesthetists. The reason for the book is Dr. El and Bernard believe there's a real change in the healthcare system that patients ought to be aware of, and physicians as well. If you just look at the numbers, it's quite striking. Although there are over a million physicians in the United States, which is actually a fairly low number when you look at other industrialized countries, you look at the growth of nurse practitioners. In 2010, there were 109,000 nurse practitioners. Ten years later, 2020, there are 290,000. That's almost a 300% growth. So your likelihood of encountering nurse practitioners in regular care or specialty care is quite high. What does this mean for you as a patient? What does it mean for you as a physician? What does it mean for you as a nurse practitioner who might be looking for a job? All these things are critical things that we need to ask and examine. And doctors Bernard and El Ajbra certainly bring an interesting perspective that I think you'll find enlightening whether you agree or not. But before we get to the show, do you feel overwhelmed by all of your different responsibilities as a partner, parent, and physician? Do you feel burned out or stressed out? If so, we want you to know that there is a hope. Professional coaching for doctors has been shown to improve all these problems. And right now, the Alpha Coaching Experience, a coaching program meant specifically for busy physicians who want to build a life they love and deserve, is open for enrollment. As part of the fall Alpha Coaching Experience, we want to invite you to a free webinar being taught by Dr. Jimmy Turner over at The Physician Philosopher. The webinar is called Defeat Burnout Without Leaving Medicine. You can register for this free webinar by visiting thephysicianphilosopher.com slash webinar. There are only three webinars. The last one is on November 1st. So don't miss out on getting some free teaching on how to coach yourself to become the best partner, parent, and physician you can be. Visit thephysicianphilosopher.com slash webinar for more information. And as I mentioned in the last show, I've been a member of this email list for over a year now. It's not one where you get a lot. You get just a synopsis of articles that have been written over the past week, occasional offers from Dr. Turner, it's very reasonable, and it's not something that you're going to feel like you're being spammed. I'd also like to point out that the book I discussed with Dr. David Graham, From Killer to Common Cold, about herd protection and the transitional phase, that is a book, is now also an audiobook, narrated by yours truly. So if you feel like you're just not getting quite enough of me in your head, then you can order the audiobook today, where all our audiobooks are sold. Again, that's From Killer to Common Cold by Dr. David Graham, narrated by Dr. Eric Larson. Finally, and thanks again to all of you who share the show and those of you who support the show financially at patreon.com slash the paradox. You can sign up to be a monthly pledge, which helps keep the lights on and helps pay for the promotion and production of the show. But without further ado, Dr. Rebecca Bernard from Gulf Coast DPC on Patients at Risk. Enjoy. Hello, I'm here with my friend, Dr. Rebecca Bernard, owner of Gulf Coast DPC in Florida, and she's the new author of a book, Patients at Risk, that she co-authored with Dr. Niran el who's also been on the Paradox podcast. Although the book is not available right now, it is available for pre-order, and a link can be found at theparadox.com slash 103. Dr. Bernard, thanks so much for joining the show. Thanks for having me. So the book's actually called Patients at Risk, The Rise of the Nurse Practitioner and Physician Assistant in Healthcare. And it will be available officially on November 16th, but it can be pre-ordered now through our publisher, which is Universal Publishers. So why don't you give us, uh, give the listeners just a, the basic premise of, I guess, your, your central hypothesis for the book. Right now, there are about 1 million physicians across the United States. 
and there are almost 500,000 what I call non-physician practitioners, which would be nurse practitioners or physician assistants. The rate in which nurse practitioners and PAs are graduating is significantly higher than that of physicians. So when you look, if you extrapolate out the graphs of the growth of the professions, eventually non-physician practitioners will outnumber physicians. So what the natural consequence of this is that you find corporations, hospitals, healthcare organizations increasingly turning to non-physician practitioners and actually replacing doctors. And it's happening across the country and it's actually been very harmful to patients in many instances. You know, our, our book follows the story of a young woman um, and she was a 19 year old girl who was very healthy, straight A student, basketball player. She was taken by ambulance to an emergency room. And she was treated by a nurse practitioner who was the only person on duty at the emergency room. Not just a, not an acute care nurse practitioner, but a family nurse practitioner who was credentialed by a multi-billion dollar organization, not a rural center, but actually a suburban center. The nurse practitioner was really not qualified to care for this young woman. And she missed the girl's pulmonary embolus because she presumed that the patient had drug toxicity. She made a number of mistakes, never reached out to a supervising physician and the patient died. And you know the thing that's the saddest, of course, the death of this young woman is tragic, but what's horrible is that this scenario is playing out across hospitals and organizations across the country. And it's really just an opportunity for corporations to save money and they will tell patients and everyone that they can that it's okay because you're getting the exact same quality of care. But the truth is there's no evidence that the quality of care is the same. And we break that down in our book, uh, describe the studies that have been done. And we explain to patients that you need to know about this so that you can be your own best advocate. And, you, you know, uh, I guess the best thing to do is kind of just figure out the terminology that we're discussing here. And um, why don't you discuss, I'm on a credentialing board for mid-level providers at my hospital. And so I see all the different people who are, uh, and would refer to as mid-level providers. These are physician assistants or PAs, the nurse practitioners, NPs, and there are various subspecialties of nurse practitioners, family, acute, geriatric, pediatric, probably missing one other. There's certified nurse midwives. There's certified registered nurse anesthetists as well, so CRNAs and CNMs. I'm probably missing someone else. I mean, those are the there's ones. 100, you know. There's 163 different designations for <laughs> nurses and different types of nurse practitioners, so there are a lot. Right. So... Uh, your book, I think, centers mainly on nurse practitioners. You you mention also the others too, but why don't you describe what the difference is, um, or I guess what is the difference between a nurse and a nurse practitioner, and the and sort of the I guess their evolution to where they are today. Well, traditionally, a nurse practitioner would have started with a degree in nursing and experience as a nurse, uh, a registered nurse, or with a bachelor's degree in nursing, which is another type of registered nurse. Traditionally, these uh, nurses that had been practicing for a while and maybe wanted to uh, get more education and experience would go on to nurse practitioner school uh, where they would then gain more, uh, more experience and more training and then be able to actually care for patients in the role of a medical provider or clinician uh, like a physician uh, in many cases. So they'll often say that they're practicing advanced nursing, but there's really very little difference when you look at what is being done as far as uh, diagnosing diseases and treating prescribing medication. Um, the difference in the two is really just the level of care that is being provided. What we're seeing now is that some uh, nurse practitioner programs are allowing individuals that have no nursing experience or nursing degree to go directly into nurse practitioner school. They call it direct entry. And you can have a bachelor's degree in any subject, you know, economics or psychology, and then seam they call it seamlessly go on to become a nurse practitioner. And this is one of the things that uh, many of us that are looking at this information are really worried about because the trends have changed. A lot of that started in 2010 with the Affordable Care Act when there was millions of dollars authorized to increase nurse practitioner training programs. With all this additional funding, the nurse practitioner programs have just come out of the woodwork and there are hundreds and hundreds of programs, many of which are completely online, many of which boast 100% acceptance rates. So no longer is it the best and the brightest, but really anyone that applies can be accepted to become a nurse practitioner. Now, the training of the nurse practitioner involves a course of study, of course, much of which can be online. And then the minimum clinical hours of experience for a nurse practitioner is 500 hours. 
After 500 hours, they may sit for their licensing examination. And then if they pass that, then they may now practice as a nurse practitioner. And in about 23 states, they can practice autonomously. Physicians have a minimum of about 15,000 clinical hours when they are finally permitted to um, be licensed. Um, and what's interesting is like the state of California recently enacted a law saying that physicians had to complete three full years of residency before they could practice. And yet they've now authorized nurse practitioners. So it's not okay to have 15,000 hours, but you can have 500 hours. So it's really in Congress, it's clearly this is, these are political issues and, and not necessarily related to patient safety. Yeah, well, I mean, when it comes to regulatory bodies, they're rarely about safety. <clears throat> and generally, the, uh, the whoever's capturing that, whether that's a big business or large industries or a large constituency, I mean, that generally tends to be who, who uh, is successful of the political realm. I think what really struck me about nurse practitioners, which is most surprising, which we're now seeing in our hospital, uh, we're seeing people who are, like, as you said, coming, you always had the assumption that people were nurses and they were on the floors, they're working for a while, and then they go for advanced training and they can be that uh, the assistant and they can do routine checks and things like that within the office. And that's sort of, I think, most people's idea of what a nurse practitioner is. But now you're seeing people who, like you said, they have no experience nursing uh, but they're going straight into basically being essentially kind of physicians, uh, you know, and um, with very little training. And I, I think, and it, and what also is is striking is that these programs are not ones like you know south southeast, you know, what you know north southeast central Arkansas state or something. I mean, we're talking about these are um, Ivy League schools that have these online programs as well. So you may see something like someone from Yale. You're like, well, they're from Yale. And yet, it's someone who has never actually had any done any patient care, and I, and it strikes me too with medicine. Medicine is such so much um, an apprenticeship, even though we have lots of classroom hours. That you, to be good at it, you have to. I mean, you have to actually do it, and it's like a hands-on. At least you know whether it's figuring out how to talk to people and get the story, the history, and things like that. I mean, it's very much a personal sort of profession. Yeah, and also you need um, the standardization that you get in medical school and you need the diversity of patient populations and that's something that's lacking in many nurse practitioner um, preceptorships. For example, the nurse practitioner that I described that, that um, contributed, she was found to be guilty for contributing to the death of that young woman, had spent her 500 hours of clinical experience working in a county health department in prenatal care for healthy young pregnant women. That was her experience and yet she was hired and credentialed by a multi-billion dollar organization to provide emergency room care, yet she had no emergency room experience as a nurse practitioner. She had been an, actually an emergency room nurse and a paramedic, but the roles are completely different than that of someone who's responsible for actually providing the medical care for extremely ill patients. Yeah, I think that's the tricky thing that we don't realize. I mean, I, I guess as a physician, in most states, I probably believe it's all states, you are technically allowed to do whatever physicians can do. Most hospitals will not allow you to practice outside of what your training is. So for instance, I'm an anesthesiologist. If I went to the hospital and said, hey, I want to start doing some heart catheterizations, they'd say, sorry, not happening here. Uh, in fact, I wouldn't be able to operate. There are a lot of things I'm not allowed to do at most hospitals, yet they are, um, they are, they are conflicted and they're, there's a difficulty when it comes to someone who's a nurse practitioner, because if you want to be, say, work in the ICU and you went through a, an, you're an FNP, which means you're a family uh, nurse practitioner, you did family practice training, there's nothing actually within the scope of practice, which is uh, a phrase you hear lots of times when you talk about medicine or you know other professions, but certainly in medicine, there's nothing in the scope of practice that says you can't, if you're an FNP, work in something where you have no experience. Um, and so and I think then the other thing is probably worth talking about the Board of Nursing versus Board of Medicines and how they are different in states. And because I think it's pretty similar to most states that they're separate boards. Right. Almost every state has a Board of Nursing that supervises nurse practitioners. And I think it's very interesting because when you look at the number, the sheer volume of individuals that are being supervised by the Board of Nursing, it's so many more because they're responsible for all levels of nursing as well as nurse practitioners. Typically, they'll have a board of 10 to 15 members, and they're responsible for many thousands of different individuals. And also sitting on that board are all ranges of nurses, not only nurse practitioners. So how does 
a, a, an LPN level or RN level nurse actually monitor and supervise the scope or practice of a nurse practitioner if that's not what they do. And usually physician uh, boards of medicine have more members on the board to be in charge of less volume of physicians. You know, we just see that boards of nursing are really struggling with being able to keep up with supervision. In fact, one of the uh, leads of the board of nursing in Kansas uh, actually spoke out against independent practice because she felt that the board was just not capable of actually being able to do their job and in making sure that practice was safe. You know, we see in Texas that the, there was a, a nurse practitioner who was found guilty for the death of two patients and harm to 10 others by prescribing inappropriate testosterone and thyroid medication. And it took almost two years for him to have his license revoked. That was actually through a great deal of effort by one of my colleagues, a physician who saw his prescribing practice and reported him and actually drove down to the capital of Texas to have a conversation with the board of nursing representatives. And, you know, look at California, their board of nursing was just uh, got, got in trouble. They've been accused of um, faking documentation because they have such a backlog and they've been accused of being complicit in the death of a child because they didn't take action against the nurse who was reported. So we know that the boards of nursing are struggling and adding more responsibilities to their plate not something that they're really capable of managing right now. Yeah, I think it's important to point out too that the difference in the sense that for medicine, physicians all have sort of the same scope of practice. I mean, I think, you know, we all have different specialties and things that we practice within the, the scope of practice medicine. But as you said, for nursing, there are different specialties within the nurse that are completely different. And so for you to try and um, regulate it, it makes it very complicated. And of course, as for, you mentioned, the numbers are just significantly, I mean, much more than you have for physicians. You know, even they don't really always understand exactly what their requirements are. You'll see a lot of discussion if you go on sure. the websites, but you know, the they created this consensus for nurse practitioners in 2000, I think 2008. And they had a they had this goal that it was going to be mandated within a, a certain number of amount of time and that deadline has already passed and many states have still not completed signing on to the standardization they've tried to create, in which, you know, if you're this kind of nurse practitioner, this is what you're supposed to do to be credentialed. And so there's still a lot of discussion and confusion, even amongst nurse practitioners themselves, about what their scope of practice is. And I think part of it is that the, the idea, they're, they're, they always like to say this thing that they practice to the full extent and authority of their license. And such a vague, vague term. And doctors will often say, well, you know, I went to medical school and I did some neurosurgery rotations. I'm a licensed doctor. So I guess it's up to my full extent of my license if I want to drill holes in people's head. But, you know, I wouldn't do that. And like you, as you mentioned, you wouldn't be able to just get credentialed to go car do cardiac caths on patients unless you've done, you've proven you're, you're, that you're qualified. Instead of this nebulous, like, well, I feel qualified. What they're supposed to do is, if they reach the extent of their training, they're supposed to then refer or uh, they like to say um, collaborate with another provider or another physician. Part of the problem is, though, if you don't know what you don't know, that's when you get into like a lot of trouble. And I have an example in the book about a nurse practitioner who evaluated a child who was vomiting and had abdominal pain. And she diagnosed the child with a urinary tract infection. Fortunately, the 10 year old had appendicitis and she died that night. And at the inquest, the nurse practitioner said, you know, I was truly uh, confident of my diagnosis. I truly believed that that's what she had. She had access to a physician she could have reached out to, but she was confident. And, and this is what we talk about Dunning-Kruger, where a person doesn't have enough knowledge or experience, they are overconfident. And that's why a lot of times people say, well, yeah, doctors have all these hours, but do they really need them? And the answer is yes. Because unless you've had that experience and training, you honestly don't know what you don't know. And that's how you get into a lot of trouble. You know, even as a physician, if I start getting cocky and overconfident, that's when I get into trouble. So this is the hubris that leads to patient harm. Yeah, I always, the Dunning-Kruber effect is also called the intern effect, right? So <laughs> yes. when, when you have the, the, the kid uh, finishes medical school, goes out into the wards and knows everything and quickly finds out within about six months uh, that they don't know much nearly as what they thought they did. And, and, you know, when you talk to residency directors, people who train physicians, the one thing they are always most concerned about is the, the resident who thinks they know everything because they're the ones who are dangerous. The ones who are kind of a little bit worried and 
cautious. Those are people you can train because knowledge is something that you can, and you know, experience comes with experience. Whereas the people who think they know everything right from the start, they're the ones who end up, you have to keep an extra eye on them because they'll do things or they'll move in ways that seem logical for them, but they don't think about other, you know, possibilities of either diagnoses or, you know, when they're doing some procedure that something could go wrong and, oh, if it goes wrong, I need a backup and you know, I hadn't thought that through. Yeah. I mean, the problem is that there's no substitute for time when it comes to learning your trade. Psychologists have shown that it takes about 10,000 hours to develop mastery in a subject. And that's assuming that you spend those 10,000 hours with really dedicated study and, you know, really assessing yourself and correcting your errors. So there's just no way that you can take a, uh, a profession, especially that involves human lives, and expect that you're going to be competent in that in 500 hours. And we know that it takes at least 10,000 hours to gain expertise. It's just not possible to substitute. There's just not a, not shortcuts when it comes to lives. Sure. Um, and then you mentioned it also, you talked in the book about other professions, I guess you'd say, uh, who are looking to expand their practice as well. So, you know, whether it's a pharmacist, a psychologist, uh, or the PAs, can you go just briefly kind of to touch on that? And it's a real slippery slope. And, you know, I, we talk about physician assistants, although um, physician assistants have a little more uh, clinical hour requirement where they graduate about 2,000. Or there are more, um, there are less online uh, classes, although Yale, uh, you mentioned Ivy League, Yale has an online PA program. Uh, so we know that physician assistants are starting to move towards independent practice, and they actually have res- have gained the right to practice independently in North Dakota. And one of the ways they've done that is they, they've tried to separate themselves from physicians. And it's, I find it so interesting because, you know, the name is physician assistant, so they didn't like that. So now they changed their name to PA, and they did that in a very calculated way in which they actually hired a marketing company and they strategized about what's the best way to rebrand ourselves. And then they had a, a marketing uh, scheme toward patients. It's called Just Say PA or Your PA Can Handle It. And so the whole idea is to get patients to feel more confident in them as the, the leader of the healthcare team. And they've also adapted something called Optimum Team Practice, which, again, is a way for them to not be tied to one or two physicians, but to be able to kind of flex and go be maybe under a hospital instead of being under a physician. So you really don't know if there is even a supervising physician in this model. And I mean, they, they say that they want to work with physicians, but the actions are speaking a little bit louder. Uh, psychologists are uh, trying to get prescription privileges and they already have it in several states. What's so interesting is that studies show that in those states, they're not just prescribing psychotropics. I mean, which would be bad enough, right? Because uh, many psychotropics have black box warnings on them and have a very high risk of uh, patient harm, but also they, in a database that was obtained, there were prescriptions for warfarin, which is a blood thinner, there were prescriptions for, I mean, all, all sorts of medications that are outside of the scope of psychology. So slippery slope. And then um, pharmacists are really interesting. Um, they have been advocating for uh, some increased right to diagnose uh, medical conditions and manage conditions. And I just, I wonder how much of that is coming from their leadership as compared to actual psychologists, because so many psychologists are feeling overwhelmed and overworked, especially in these retail uh, industries. So what's interesting is that these uh, organizations are now saying, well, what we're going to do is we're going to have the psych, the uh, pharmacy technician start filling the prescriptions so to free up the psychologist to actually manage the conditions. You mean the and pharmacist? Then, I'm sorry, the, the pharmacist. Yeah. So it's like such a slippery slope where it's like, well, that's okay. We're going to let the pharmacist play doctor and then the pharmacy technician will play pharmacist. And the same thing's happening in nursing. They, instead of having registered nurses, they said, well, let's let the uh, LPNs or the nurses aides do more tasks that used to be the nursing tasks. And, uh, you know, it just really, it's a slippery slope and we're just dumbing down the whole medical industry by, we talk about having people work at the top of their license, but Really, what it is is just trying to get the most out of the cheapest paid uh, person with possibly the least education. It's really, it's great for people that are trying to make a profit, but it isn't great for patients that might be harmed. Yeah, and this is a—I I would say this phenomenon is one that you, is entirely predictable, right? You you expect that as soon as um, that people want to, they want to 
achieve more and they want to they want to make more money. And so for for these practitioners, it's it makes sense for them to push for this politically, uh, whatever the specialty is. And and uh, any time a physician seems convinced that that won't happen is, I think, just short sighted, right? I mean, I think uh, that's just basic human nature that that's going to happen. Uh, so when when it comes to, I guess the other thing I would talk ask you about is, you know, they talk about these doctorate programs too. Uh, you know, no one who has a who has a PhD in economics is going to walk into a hospital and say, "Hey, I'm Doctor Smith," right? But there, there are plenty of people who do a couple of weeks or maybe a six months online course and they get their doctorate or it's an additional couple of months for whatever their training is. And now they're the doctor of, I don't know, nurse practitioner or whatever like that. Doctor nurse. Right. So, I mean, what is the, what is the response been within the medical community, I guess, to that? Or has there really even been any or from a legislative action that you're aware of? There's a lot of concern from physicians and other clinicians that patients are going to be confused because if, you know patients are in a very vulnerable state, especially if they're in a hospital, they're ill, they're under duress. Somebody walks in the door and introduces themselves as a doctor, then you're going to make an assumption that the physician might be wrong. And you know we don't just have doctor of nursing degrees; we have doctor of physician assistant degrees now. They call it the doctorate of medical science. And uh, you'll often see if you go on uh, review sites like Health Grades, it'll say that the nurse practitioner or the PA attended, quote, medical school. So there's, you know, we often wonder, is, is this deliberately done in order to put us all on a level playing field? We're all doctors now, or is this simply just, you know, someone that worked hard to get a, a, a terminal degree and now they're proud to have a doctorate? You know, and, and like you mentioned, if you're in a non-clinical setting, it wouldn't be an issue. But when you're in a, a position in which patients might not really have truth and transparency, and they may not be able to make a choice, then it becomes more concerning. Uh, so the biggest problem that I see with the doctorate of nurse practice is that only 15% of all DNP programs are clinical. So that means that 85%, and that, that was according to an article written by Mary Mundinger, who is a nurse researcher, who has uh, actually been a very strong advocate for nurse practitioner independence. And she actually wrote this study wrote up this paper saying, you know, she's concerned because we need more actual clinically trained nurse practitioners. And instead, these doctorate programs are kind of pumping out graduates that are really not prepared clinically. They receive more courses in things like, you know, informatics and, you know, clinical research, and but not necessarily on direct patient care. The other thing is that they only require an additional 1,000 clinical hours during that doctorate program. And some programs actually allow them to use hours that they obtained previously to apply to that 1,000 hours. So having a doctorate doesn't necessarily give nurse practitioners that additional clinical expertise that they need to treat patients. All right. So now, now we're going to push back a little bit because, uh, you know, one of the arguments here is, you know, you make a, you make an interesting argument here that nurse practitioners are, have less training and they're, um, they're potentially more dangerous out in the community. You know, most people coming in for like a family, let's say a family medicine clinic, they're not going to keel over. There's probably not much you can do to them that's going to um, cause them significant harm. Uh, you know, if you prescribe too many antibiotics or things like that, maybe on the margins, it makes a difference. But there are places in this country that just don't have access to good medical care. And so that was one of the main arguments for the, uh, the Affordable Care Act and for lots of these initiatives in state legislatures to give autonomous um, practice rights to to uh, the middle levels because, you know, in these small towns, there's nobody to take care of people. They can't afford a physician, so why don't we find someone who is you know less expensive, maybe not as much of an expert, but they at least can go and provide care for those people. So, I mean, that's the main argument or that that's that's used in the state legislatures. I've heard it in Michigan uh, many times. Yeah, I've got lots of responses. First of all, there is a promise that nurse practitioners and PAs will go into these rural and underserved areas, but that hasn't panned out. If you look at state data, you'll see that there are, that family physicians are the number one medical clinician to work in an underserved and rural area. In areas that have permitted independent practice, there has not been a mass uh, growth of nurse practitioners into rural and underserved areas. They did a pilot program. They spent over $120 million specifically drive nurse practitioners into rural areas and in primary care. And of, at, at the end of that, it was actually a complete failure. I think 9% of nurse practitioners in that program actually stayed in a rural area. So these, uh, this idea that these uh, 
clinicians are going to work and provide access where no one else wants to do it is, is a fallacy because it's not happening. So that's number one. Number two, the argument that, uh, well, isn't some care better than no care? Well, the answer is no. And studies have shown, there was a very large study produced by Harvard that reviewed patient care uh, in the, in the, across the world. And they looked at developing countries and they found that um, poor quality of care was associated with more patient deaths than a lack of access to care. And that's because the poor quality of care actually harmed more patients. They would have actually done better to have no care at all. So what this idea that some access is better than no access is actually wrong. Additionally, there is no cost savings. Studies have shown since the very first nurse practitioner studies in the late 60s and early 70s that nurse practitioners cost more money. They order more tests. They prescribe more medication, they order more laboratories, and uh, they actually end up, they refer more often. So they actually cost more money. This has been shown over and over again. It's only getting worse, and I think the diploma mills will make that worse. Nurse practitioner and PA uh, x-ray ordering, for example, has increased by 440% over the last couple of years, while the ordering of x-rays by physicians has decreased. So those were, will be my three counterpoints to why the access issue is really just simply untrue. Yeah, my my argument with the uh, legislators who ask me, you know, they'd say, well, I've got a, I'm in a rural county or a couple of counties I represent. We've got one or two hospitals. We need people to take care of people. And I just need, to, I need to find people who can come out and actually help. And I said, well, the problem is you need to move your hospital out of Alpena, right? <laughs> that the problem, because it turns out that people who want to live in urban areas uh, and not live in rural areas is pretty much the same. It doesn't matter what your profession is, right? I don't think there's a, there's any reason to think it'd be any different. Um, well, that's exactly what the Harvard study said. They yeah. said, you know, up till now, we've been putting these little tiny health clinics in all these rural areas and then trying to get people to go there to work. But what would act, what actually works better is to get the more urban centers and actually move, take the patients and transport them to these centers, the larger sure. centers. Um, you know, and then the other the other argument, of course, with a lot of this is, and this is one you'll get from uh, more libertarian leading people is, you know, you have all this licensing. It, wouldn't it just be simpler if you just said, Hey, it's up to the patients to really, to be advocates for themselves. They can, they can figure out who's taking care of them. They, if these people are doing a good job or not, because if they're not, they're not going to last in the market. What do you say to that argument? Because I think it's a, I think it's a fairly powerful one. When Alexis Ochoa, the 19 year old girl who died, her boyfriend found out that she had been seen by a nurse practitioner and not a physician. He found out from the attorney during a deposition. He broke down and cried. He wept. He had no idea she was a nurse practitioner. He testified, including her mother, that they were under the impression and they were told or led to believe that this was a physician or at least as competent as a physician. The website for Mercy El Reno Hospital said that patients would have 24-7 access to a physician. So yes, in a free market, true, uh, open, honest, and transparent system, then I say yes, nurse practitioners and PAs can do whatever they like and patients can you know, make the best decision for them. That's not being something that's happening. And it's actually an issue of social justice because patients who are underserved who work in community, who have to rely on community health centers, places like that, they don't get a choice. And even in, in major corporations in big cities, they don't get a choice. Now, there's actually a law, the Rural Health Care Act of 1977, actually mandated that uh, rural health clinics that are federally funded must staff with at least 50% nurse practitioners or physician assistants. So many of these clinics that might want to hire a physician can't because they're being mandated to do that. So patients don't have an option. And that's what we're seeing. And especially when we are now in a corporate mentality so unfortunate because more physicians are employed by hospitals or organizations than, than own themselves. But then you have the types of specialties that have no choice, like how is an anesthesiologist or an ER doctor going to practice their trade without a hospital or some organization, especially considering that we're not allowed to own hospitals according to the ACA. So in short, the short answer is yes, it would, it would be fine if we were in a free market system, but unfortunately we're not in that. And especially when it comes to hospital care. Yeah, and that's always the tricky thing, right? Because we we don't find ourselves in a in an ideal situation. We're not starting from scratch, and so we're kind of in this limbo. And I don't know. I mean, I went so I ran for state office. I Spock talks this on my show at, in 2010. And the hardest questions were real scope of practice because I think 
they're really hard because you have to you have to you deal with the reality that it exists. And how do you get to wherever you think you know might be better if you want to market based solutions? How do you get there by being you know and being fair at the same time? It's not easy. It it you you can have a pure answer, but it's um it's really fairly tricky. When it comes to to Medicare, I think it's interesting too. You know, there's well, I guess maybe to back up the economic interests that that align. You say that nurse practitioners and uh, PAs they order more tests, they order more stuff because presumably they have a little bit. Uh, more difficulty coming to diagnosis. And so they need more tests. And so that's a crutch. Uh, if you're a health system, actually, that's a, you're for one thing, you're paying these people less. But if your health system, invariably, that's actually really good, right? You want more referrals, you want more test orders, you want more um, scans run, because that's extra revenue to to you. So I mean, this, it seems like there's actually a huge advantage for having for having people. And I've actually had physicians tell me that they were got in trouble for not, you know, referring enough or whatever. And that's like, well, that's kind of the point of having me around. I'm actually, you don't need to refer. Yeah. It's like a pinball game in some of these organizations where, you know, you see one doctor or nurse practitioner for a problem, you answer something on the review of systems. And next thing you know, you're sitting in a specialist office for something you really didn't even have a concern about. I've seen that happen in organizations that I've worked for personally. So there's definitely an incentive for hospitals and organizations to, they make their money off of ancillary tests. They make their money off of specialty consults. I think the study is something like for every family physician in a system, the company makes a million dollars and they're not making that off of the family physician feeling, right. making it off of those referrals. So all the more so if you have an individual that uh, just orders a lot of tests and refers a lot of patients because they don't know how to form a proper differential diagnosis. So that is the big problem. I don't know if I mean, this whole idea of value-based care, I mean, don't get me started on that, but I mean, people will say to you that, well, value-based care should help that, but I don't know that they've figured out a way to truly uh, make that work out. Yeah. Well, I think, and I, I think actually just today or yesterday, the CMS came out with a evaluation of a lot of their value-based payment plans. And I think of the was it 87 plans they've, they've implemented only five had shown any sort of cost savings and most of them are negative or, um, or neutral at best, which is not surprising, right? I mean, when you have a very complicated healthcare system and you have, you line up incentives for people to make money certain ways, they're going to make money those certain ways and design their systems around that. And not in, without the, the patient in, in mind, I guess, really you'd say for their po- pocketbook. Uh, so for you, if you're a patient, so I have, I always say about a half the listeners to my show are not physicians. And um, what, what do you, if you're a patient, what are you concerned about? What do you, how do you advocate for yourself? And, you know, what do you need to, I guess, how do you need to conduct yourself in the healthcare world now? We actually wrote this book for patients. You know, my co-author and I were, we were really touched by the story of Alexis Ochoa. And we just wanted to get the word out to patients so that they would know the difference so that they can make an educated decision. So I mean, the first thing is just to simply know the different types of medical clinicians that you might encounter in the healthcare system. And then you can make your own decision after you've researched and you know a little bit more about uh, those diff- the different backgrounds. And then you decide that seeing a physician is the right thing for you, then you need to speak out and you need to ask for a physician. In some cases, maybe demand a physician. You know, we wonder if Alexis may have had a different outcome if she or her family had known enough to say, have you talked to even a physician about this case? Uh, so patients need to know and be empowered to be able to do that. Um, that's really the most important thing. They need to know what these um, titles with the abbreviations after people's names mean. Usually the shorter the abbreviation, the better you are. Because if a physician is either an MD or a DO, unless they trained in the UK, they might be an MBBS. But uh, the short, those are short abbreviations. If you see a long string of letters uh, after somebody's name, might want to ask them, you know, what is your, what are you, what is your profession? Because uh, chances are they might not actually be a physician. Um, I always tell my patients that for a new, brand new problem, they should be evaluated by a physician or for a worsening problem. Uh, Nurse practitioners and physician assistants have an incredible role to play in our healthcare system. And studies have validated that when physicians, nurse practitioners, and PAs work together in a team, patients can get great care. physician can start a plan of care and have a nurse practitioner or PA follow up on different issues, but they really shouldn't be, they don't have the training and the experience to be making diagnoses 
So I, I always recommend that patients at least have their initial evaluation with a physician and always seek a physician if their situation is getting worse or they're having changes. Yeah, and I would, I would add to that that when I've worked, I work most closely probably with, um, when it comes to nurse practitioners, with neonatals when I'm in the uh, C-section suite. And yeah, I mean, great. It's great having them, and they do a fantastic job in their in their role. And I think that's a great collaboration, and they're very valuable members of the team. I, there's no question about that. Um, and and actually, I found also, especially with this credentialing, that these diploma mills, we'll just call them that, because I think that's essentially what they are, the, the paper factories. There, the nurse practitioners are as much as worried about that, if not more so, than you know, for people coming in, sort of <laughs> defaming their profession and making them seem like they're they're not qualified to be there and because that reflects on you because oh I had a nurse practitioner and she never seen a patient before or just shadowed someone for 500 hours and anyway it they're they're as much concerned about that as um, as we are probably. they are and we and I've heard from many of them I get actually as occasionally I get hate mail and negative messages but I get so many more supportive emails and messages from nurse practitioners and physician assistants saying I am just so deeply concerned about what's going on. This is not what I signed up for. This is not what I want. And we've had several that have come to our group and have actually spoken out publicly where they've said that they've made reports to the nursing credentialing organizations, to the AANP, the Nurse Practitioner Association, and have begged them to make changes, but they're not seeing their leadership take the appropriate action to put a stop to this. All right. So then let's go to so, I mean, guess what's the solution here? Because if I'm a legislator, my solution is I want to get as many people who can practice medicine. And you, you have a study that's saying that it may not, just because someone is practicing medicine doesn't mean it's helpful. It may be actually harmful. Uh, so what is my solution? Because, you know, I'm that guy and I've got a representative district in northern Michigan. It's rural. I can't get anyone to come there. So what do you, what do you tell that legislator? Because you're, if you're, you're saying, well, this is not the solution. What would their solution be that you think they should go with? I think it's important to that legislators and everyone knows that position that the United States has one of the lowest physician production in the world of other comparable countries. The U.S. ranks 24th out of 28 similar nations with physician production. We have, I think it's like 2.8 physicians per 100,000 people. The only countries that are lower than us are Canada, Mexico, uh, Poland, and South Korea. So uh, compare that to countries like Austria and Norway, which have four to five, is like more than double the number of physicians for the same amount of population. So we do not have as many physicians as other nations. We need to increase our production, but most importantly, we need to increase uh, access to residency programs. And I would advocate that we need to increase our primary care production because studies show over and over that having the same doctor over time lowers mortality and that specialists also, but physician, a primary care physician to a greater point, having a primary care physician is associated with the lowering of all cause mortality. And that's a decrease in heart attacks and decrease in cancer deaths. So the studies are very clear that having a robust primary care workforce is critical to our nation's health. So we need to increase medical school enrollment a little bit more. It, it has increased a little, but we can go more with that and we must have or residency programs so that physicians can get that these 10,000 hours that they need to be competent in their field. Yeah, and that's the, well, I'd say the million dollar question, but it's more like a trillion dollar question, right? Like how do you train, um, you know, we've looked at how do you train more residents and we've looked at residents within our practice and it's, it's amazing how expensive it is to have a resident. It's like, a, I think about a quarter million dollar investment per resident per year. And so it's not small change, right? For either a hospital system or a state or, or certainly a private practice to try and pony up that much money, the amount of um, the cost you know, maybe, that you get from. Yeah. Part of that is, you know, the, this is happening at these big tertiary health centers in many cases. And I think maybe increasing community-based uh, re residency programs might be one possible solution that may not be quite as expensive. Yeah, it's possible. Although, and you know, that that's anesthesia. So it may be less expensive for family practice. Although I would say, at least in talking to other individuals who are in, familiar with the ACGME, which is the American College of Graduate Medical Education, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, they have set rules for how many, you know, you have to have a residency director. You have to have a, all these sorts of positions and you have to pay these people. They have to be full-time or at least part-time or, you know, some sort of combination. 
And that's a, like an added infrastructure for whatever the program may be. So it's not, it's not inexpensive uh, starting. No, these programs. and medical school isn't either. You know, there are some yeah. advocates that would say that maybe we need to consider a more European system. You know, U.S. We do four years of college, four years of medical school, and then a residency, uh, which is a minimum of three years. In Europe, they usually skip college and they do kind of a combined medical school college curriculum. Uh, in some countries, the residency training is a little bit more abbreviated. I'm sure that there are some areas that could be changed. Um, I mean, in my third year of my family medicine residency, there was a fair number of elective rotations that maybe weren't 100% valuable to my, you know, my practice. So there might right. be some room for tweaking some of that. And like you said, asking yourself, do we need to spend are all of these things that are requirements? Are they must-haves? So I guess I guess an area for study where we need to determine what is absolutely essential to turning out a great primary care physician or any physician. And there's nothing easier than turning on giant bureaucracies. They're oh, yes. Let's change the system. <laughs> uh, what would you advocate for? So uh, clearly right now, this this phenomenon of having people, um, PAs, nurse practitioners, all these other uh, mid-level providers, the momentum is definitely on their side. It's definitely going. It's definitely happening. There's every economic incentive for it to happen. There's a political incentive for it to happen. As their constituency, as there are more of them, their political you know power grows. They're much more invested in. Um, it's a lot more easier to get people to add add uh, responsibilities than take them away. At least is from a you know if you're a physician, say you want to stop scope of practice, you have to keep fighting the same bill year after year after year after year. Uh, and it gets kind of tiring paying money to a PAC, you know, political action committee to, to pro- try and prevent that. So eventually you lose for, you know, some, um, so if it's, if it's here to stay, it's going to grow. What do you, what sort of things do we, do you think need to be in place to make their practice as safe as possible for patients? I don't think that independent practice by a non-physician is safe. And I don't think there's any way that you can make it safe. I just don't think it's realistic at this stage in the game. It would basically require total revamping of the training and a significant increase in the number of hours, a lot of standardization, a lot of vetting to make sure that practice is safe. If those things were to happen, then yes, I would, I would say let's, let's look at that. I think there always needs to be physician involvement and physician supervision to have safe practice. And I agree with you that I, I've tried working as well, trying to make the case uh, for why this is important, right? The political will just isn't there. Um, And instead, it's more about convenience and shortcuts and, um, you know, temporary fixes, which is what we're really, uh, we try to do a lot of. So that's one of the reasons that we wrote this book, because we wanted to just speak to to patients directly, because we can't rely on uh, government agencies or politicians to necessarily act in the best interest of patient safety, especially when they have, they're hearing from nurses and nurse practitioners much more aggressively than they're hearing from physicians, I think. Right. So the AMA often says, you know, we, although they advocate for scope, they have, you know, 10 million other things that they're busy with their, you know, spending their political capital on, whereas the American Association of Nurse Practitioners has one important issue that they spend their political capital on. So I think what's important is that patients are just educated and aware. And like you said, they're going to have to make what they think is the best decision for their health, but they also need to have that information, have all the facts. I know as a primary care physician, I refer to my specialty colleagues when I know that the physician is going to see my patient. I don't mind if they use a physician extender. Or, I'm sorry, if the nurse practitioners and physician assistants do not like the term extender, they not like the term mid-level either. They like advanced practice. Um, provider or advanced something, yep. but I don't say that because if they're advanced, I don't know what I am or you are uh, like super duper duper advanced. I don't know. <laughs> so um, I always, that's why I say non-physician practitioners because that is accurate. Um, but yeah, patients just need to know what they're getting into. And so when I refer to a specialist, I expect my patient to be seen by the physician. And if the, they want to delegate follow-up to their assistant and that I have no problem with that, but I get very insulted if I send someone to a physician, a specialist for extra expertise beyond what I know, and they see someone that has significantly less training than I do. And so I think as physicians, that's something that we can do. We can make sure that we refer to physicians that properly supervise and um, that we also just are not afraid to talk about this issue because there is a lot of fear 
doctors are terrified to speak out. Um, my friend, Steve um, Marin, who is a pediatrician after he worked for oh, something like 18 years at a community health center in Arizona, he wrote a very nice op-ed. He was responding to an op-ed that said nurse practitioners could do the same thing as physicians. He wrote an op-ed that said, I highly respect nurse practitioners. They're great. In fact, I think physicians can learn a thing or two from them from that bedside manner. However, they're not the same as physicians. And here's why. Here's the training difference. He was fired days later. He was told that his opposition to nurse practitioners uh, went against the um, policy of mutual respect and lost his job. And that happens to physicians that speak out. They're forced to supervise, even if they may not have any control over who's being hired or whether the, there's any kind of sanctioning for improper care. And uh, a lot of them really have to keep their job because they, maybe they work for a hospital organization and they can't just hang a shingle like some of us can. So those of us who can speak out really need to let patients know so that they can make their own best choice. Yeah, I thought one of the interesting points you made in the book that you argue that one of the things physicians can do is to, to not be employed. So what I think it's huge. I mean, self, so much of our problems in our healthcare system have come from us selling ourselves into indentured servitude. And now we basically are controlled by these corporations. And the type of care that's being enacted doesn't do anyone any favors. Doctor, physician burnout is, is high. Patients are annoyed that their doctor won't look at them in the eye because they're staring at a computer screen. And, and this is one of the reasons that patients like nurse practitioners and sometimes PAs too, because they'll say, well, they listen to me and they're really nice. And doctors need to listen and we need to be really nice too. But sometimes it's hard for us to, to empathize or show our empathy because we're so chained to a computer system that's forcing us, you know, forcing our head down. So I think one of the very best things we can do is to own ourselves again and get back our autonomy, or if we are going to be employed, that we insist on certain parameters. And if we all got together and we all agreed that this is how we were going to behave, then maybe we would be able to gain a little bit more control back. Yeah, I think, you know, production pressures are a real thing. And I think that's something that uh, it, although it's not a great excuse, it's definitely a reality that you're expected to do a certain amount of work. And, um, you know, that's something that's just a reality. Uh, I would also uh, recommend people listen to the show. It'll be linked again at the show notes. Uh, our previous discussion where you talked about your 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 interaction with the regional healthcare, cl- it's a regional healthcare clinic where you, you talked about your experience in having these regulations that are kind of nonsensical, as most regulations often are, um, to... I guess guarantee yeah, I mean, a certain percentage my, of people working someplace. My personal experience took me from being an extremely left-wing, liberal, idealistic, save the world person. The government has a huge role to, and it, it completely flipped me. I mean, that's how powerful that experience was. You know, and not that I don't lean left on some things, but when it comes to healthcare, that experience just broke me. And, and I'm not the only one. I talk to my colleagues who had similar experiences, and I, I very rarely find someone who says, wow, yeah, no, I had a great experience working in a place like that. Uh, they actually break you down. <laughs> so, um, yeah, please check out that. That was, a, I think, a very interesting discussion that we had and something that a lot of people are not aware of. All right. Well, Dr. Bernard, thank you so much for being on The Paradox and for your book, Patients at Risk, and um, with Dr. Niran el Ajra. Where, uh, beside from pre-ordering the book, where should people find out more of what you're doing and writing and all that sort of thing? The book will be available on Amazon, but also if you're more, if you're interested in learning more about physician-led care and issues, and I'd highly encourage you to check out physiciansforpatientprotection.org, which is a group of physicians, um, retired and active practicing and medical students and residents, and we have just one mission, and that is to advocate for physician-led care truth and transparency among healthcare practitioners. So I'll encourage you to check out our website there. You can always see me on my website, which is RebeccaBernard.com. All right. Thank you so much for being on the Paradox. Thank you. Thanks for listening to The Paradox. If you like what The Doc is doing, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes or Stitcher. And share the show with your friends. 
Become a supporting listener to get access to special bonuses at patreon.com forward slash the paradox. Show notes can be found at theparadox.com. Thank you.